Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we conduct a harvest of the major headlines regarding the Vatican and the global church. And from the past week, it has been, once again, a wowzer, a doozy of a week. Here's what we've got for you. We begin with a cold case turns hot. The Vatican's longest-running unsolved mystery generates a war of words over the legacy of St. John Paul II. We'll unpack what went on there. Second, of polls and paradoxes, a new survey of Italians has basically good news for Pope Francis, but there are a couple of ironies that need to be explained. We'll look at the ironies in the fire in terms of Italian public opinion. Third, the Ukrainians fire back, only this time not at the Russians, but at the Vatican, in what is becoming kind of an annual tradition here in Rome. Lots of Ukrainians are upset at the way the Vatican handled its Good Friday Via Crucis procession. We'll take a look at what their beef is. And finally, oh Madonna, how a bleeding Madonna in the small Italian commune of Treviano Romano has become the most talked about news story in Italy over the past week. All that and more is waiting for you on last week in the church, so please, for the love of God and all that is holy, don't go anywhere. All right, before we begin this week, Our good friends at Longbeard, that is the digital design and marketing company that produces this video and distributes it, informed me last week that we have crossed a couple of milestones here on Last Week in the Church. First, I am told we now have more than 10,400 subscribers to our, I don't even know what to call it, channel, station, platform on YouTube. Whatever the right nomenclature is, there are a lot of you who have signed up for it, and we're deeply grateful for that. The other thing is, we have passed more than a million views for this program, which astonishes me. Frankly, I'm not even sure I would watch me if I weren't compelled to sit here and listen to myself prattle on. But the fact that so many of you have chosen to do so, we are deeply grateful. And, you know, while I am expressing gratitude and all of that, let me just say that when you are on the Crux page checking things out, if you also feel inclined to cough up a little dough, that is, to make a small financial contribution to Crux, we would be deeply grateful because while we love bringing this show to you, it isn't cheap. It actually costs money to do all of this, and we would be unable to do it were it not for your support. You will find on the Crux page, www.cruxnow.com, there's a handy dandy little page there to make a small contribution. Whatever you could do to help, we would be very grateful. But whether you do that or not, if you are enjoying this program, if you have as much fun watching it as we do making it, I mean, that's some. All right, so we begin this week with a cold case that has turned hot. So, If you are a regular viewer of this show, if you are part of those more than one million people who allegedly have seen it, you will know that the most notorious unsolved mystery story in the Vatican is the case of Emanuela Orlandi, 15-year-old daughter of a minor official in the prefecture of the papal household in 1983, who on June 22, 1983, had a music lesson, and then afterwards disappeared, just gone, poof, vanished into the wind. And ever since, and of course we are coming up on the 40th anniversary of her disappearance this June 22nd, her fate, you know, what happened to her has been a source of never-ending speculation and conspiracy theories. And over the years, it has involved everything from geopolitics, to the Roman mob, to pedophilia and sex abuse, I mean, you know, what have you. So this case was brought back to light recently by a four-part Netflix documentary called Vatican Girl. That generated new momentum around trying to get to the bottom of what had happened to 
Omanuelo Orlandi. The Italian parliament has launched its own inquest, and a few months ago, the Vatican, in the form of its chief prosecutor, Italian layman Alessandro Didi, announced it too would be opening an investigation. And this past week, on Wednesday, Didi, the prosecutor, held a meeting, an eight-hour meeting, with the brother of Emanuelo Orlandi, Pietro Orlandi, her older brother, who has dedicated his life, basically, to trying to find out what happened to his sister. So Pietro Orlandi had a meeting with Didi, and also there was a meeting between Didi and Laura Segro, who was the lawyer representing the Orlandi family. Now, eight hours, you can imagine, they talked about all kinds of stuff. After the meeting, Orlandi went on Italian television, basically the highest rated nighttime talk show in the country, to discuss, you know, what had gone on in this meeting and, you know, kind of the state of things with regard to the hunt for the truth about his sister's disappearance. And during that talk show, Orlandi had some, well, gosh, what would you say? Shocking things to say about the late Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul II. Basically, here's what happened. Orlandi said that he was told, and this is what he said, I've been told that in the evenings, Voitia, that's the given name of St. John Paul II, would go out with a couple of Polish monsignors. And according to Orlandi, they were not going out to bless houses. So there was a suggestion that something untoward was going on. Then Orlandi played a portion of an audio recording on this TV program, allegedly with a member of the Roman mob, in which this mobster said that John Paul II had brought young girls into the Vatican and that after a while this had become intolerable and that the Secretary of State, who at the time was the late Italian Cardinal Agostino Casaroli, had had to intervene to get rid of these girls, and he had asked somebody in the prison system to get somebody in the Roman mob to help him. The suggestion being that John Paul had somehow brought girls into the Vatican for sexual purposes, and that these girls had eventually been eliminated, that is, killed by members of the Roman mob at the Vatican's request. Now, you can imagine the firestorm that this set off. First of all, we had the longtime priest secretary to St. John Paul, now the retired Cardinal of Krakow, Cardinal Stanislaw Jivish, reacting to all of this. And Jivish, who, you know, I mean, I know Jivish reasonably well. You know, I was here for the last decade of John Paul's papacy and many times was around Jivish, either interviewing him or just in settings where he was there. You know, he is not generally the, what would I say, not a great orator. But on this occasion, I think he cobbled together one of the most memorable pieces of polemical, you know, sort of rhetorical tradecraft that we've stumbled across. He said that what was going on was, and I'm quoting here, a maelstrom of misdirection, mythomania, and profiteering. Now, I mean, if you were going to give an award for the greatest, like, slam in, in terms of, you know, verbiage, you know, that, that's right up there, right? And basically what Jeevish was saying, that is, this is not only just totally bogus, but that it's being put forward in order to make money off of it. That was the suggestion. Then, after Jeevish, the Vatican's media machine weighed in, the Vatican's editorial director, Andrea Tornielli, published a piece simultaneously in L'Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, and also Vatican News, their website, basically saying that Orlandi and Segro, the lawyer, had offered no proof of these accusations against John Paul II at all, and that it was irresponsible to, you know, sort of shoot these accusations out of a cannon with no backup. Further, they suggested that Didi, the prosecutor, had asked for proof and none was forthcoming. Segro then responded to that saying, well, look, 
Oh, and there was also a suggestion that Segro had invoked attorney-client privilege to, you know, as an excuse for not providing any information. Segro then responded saying, hey, this isn't true. You know, Pietro Orlandi turned over all kinds of information to Didi, so forth and so on. Orlandi himself later said that he had given this recording of this mobster guy by the name of Marcello Noroni to Didi with the idea that Didi should investigate. And, and Orlandi was trying to walk it back saying, hey, it wasn't me making these accusations against John Paul II. I was simply quoting this Roman mobster and I want, you know, whether that's true or not, you know, that's up to the Vatican to investigate. Now, this was simmering over the weekend. And then on Sunday, during his noontime Regina Chaley address, Pope Francis himself weighed into all of this, noting that Sunday was Divine Mercy Sunday, a feast that was instituted by John Paul II. Pope Francis said, you know, he was sure he joined believers all around the world in expressing gratitude to John Paul II, especially in the context of what he called these irresponsible and unfounded accusations that had been floated against John Paul. So a stirring defense of John Paul from Pope Francis himself. Now, you know, in terms of whether there is any merit at all to these suggestions, I mean, we should note that this audio recording of this Roman mobster, alleged Roman mobster, Marcello Nerone, was actually made in 2009. So it has been around for 14 years. It was made by a journalist who now runs a blog called Criminal Nights, which is sort of about, oh, rumors and conspiracy theories and all sorts of unsourced crime reporting. And that this recording, the journalist who runs this blog actually first referred to it in January. At that time, a retired Italian judge came forward to say, hey, I know this guy. This guy, Marcello Noroni, wanted to be an informant for the Italian Secret Service. Never really came up with anything particularly actionable. And basically casting aspersions on this guy's reliability. You know, obviously, I presume this will be looked at both by Italian investigators and also by Vatican investigators. But at least at this point, it should be emphasized that if you are going to put forward accusations against a former pope and a canonized saint on the basis of the unsourced and unsubstantiated testimony of a confessed former criminal, you know, I don't think you should be overly surprised that there's going to be some blowback to that. So two observations to me suggest themselves. One. There are certain just no-fly zones in Catholic debate, okay? You know, in general about the Catholic Church, you can say whatever you want and sort of get away with it, but there are a couple of, like, you know, just things you don't do. Third rails you should not touch, okay? Let me give you an example. Nuns, okay? You can say pretty much whatever you want, but if you were perceived as being mean to nuns, like, opinion is going to come down on you like a ton of bricks. Like, you know, when the Vatican under Benedict XVI launched that investigation of American nuns, I could have told them that was a terrible idea. Here's why. In 1980, the movie The Blues Brothers came out. I was 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school. I wanted to see the movie. And my friend, my best friend at the time, a guy named Brian Beaker, we wanted to go see this movie. But we couldn't get in because it was R-rated. So I convinced my grandpa, the sweetest guy on earth, I've only seen him mad one time in his life, and this was it. My grandpa agreed to take Brian and I to go see the Blues Brothers. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know one of the characters in this movie is a really mean nun, okay? After the movie, okay, we come out. Brian and I had thought it was hilarious. I looked at my grandpa and I asked, what'd you think? My grandpa, furious, like red in the face, veins throbbing on his forehead, spittle flying out of his mouth, looked at me and said, you cannot make fun of nuns like that. You can't do it. That is Catholic opinion at its most basic. Okay, so one no-fly zone in the churches, don't make fun of nuns. Okay, don't be mean to nuns. Just don't do it. All right, second, 
do not make fun, do not cast aspersions on saints, especially the most beloved saints of our time, okay? And John Paul II falls into the category. You know, second conclusion and related, you have to wonder, Pietro Orlandi and his lawyer, Laura Segura, what are they really after here? I mean, do they actually want a serious investigation? Because if so, coming out of being heard by the chief investigator and then essentially taking a blowtorch to the memory of John Paul II would not seem to me to be the best way to create a constructive working relationship with Vatican authorities. So you have to wonder, what's the actual aim here? You know, is it to get an investigation? Or, you know, is it simply to create a situation in which you can continue to complain the Vatican is not taking you seriously and make that your calling card? I don't know. You know, we will see how this plays out. But in any event, moral of the story here, if you want to get the Vatican to do something, you know, probably going after in the worst way imaginable the legacy and memory of a beloved pope and saint, probably not the best way to go about it. All right, secondly, of polls and paradoxes. So there was a new Italian poll conducted by the country's leading research institute in early April. And among other things, they asked people about their trust levels in the pope. And basically it was good news. Pope Francis has a trust level of 64% nationwide which is one of the highest in the country. It is slightly below doctors and nurses who, of course, are still benefiting from the incredible reputation for heroism they got during the period of the coronavirus. But it puts Francis well ahead of most other social groups like politicians, for instance. It also puts him ahead, by the way, of his own bishops, who in Italy have a trust level of about 25%, and his own pastors, who have a trust level somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. So, you know, in comparison, the Pope is doing pretty well. But two interesting notes to all of this. One is that there is a marked difference between practicing Catholics and non-practicing Catholics when it comes to trust in the Pope. And it's not what you might think. Like, you know, Intuitively, you might think that the more committed a Catholic you are, like the more often you go to church, the more you're going to like the Pope, right? It's not how it works. Actually, the trust level of Catholics who say they almost never go to Mass in Pope Francis is 85%. Trust level of Catholics who say they try to go to Mass once a week, don't always get there, but try to go once a week, is exactly the national average, 64 for Catholics who say they go at least once a week and often more, trust level is about 50%, between 50 and 45. In other words, there's an inverse relationship. The more committed a Catholic you are, at least in Italy, the less likely you are to have faith in Pope Francis. Which is why I have sometimes said that Pope Francis has a Mikhail Gorbachev problem. He is extraordinarily popular outside the church and at the margins of the church, is a little bit more controversial the further inside you get, okay? Now, the other thing that is interesting is that Pope Francis is very much a pope of the peripheries, right? And he's a pope of the underdog, the underclass. He's a tribune of the poor. Yet what this poll shows is that in Italy, at least, his strongest base of support is the middle class and people who live in the urban core of Italian cities, which typically is where the elites live. His ratings are lower among the poor and people who live in the peripheries, that is, on the outskirts of Italian cities. And, you know, I suppose this is probably less an x-ray in reaction to Pope Francis himself and more an x-ray of the estrangement from the church of the working and popular classes, not just in Italy, but in much of Europe, which is an old story, of course, but this poll would suggest it's still very much with us. So, in other words, the two paradoxes here are, the more committed a Catholic you are, the less trust you have in the Pope, at least in Italy. And secondly, the more you are the object of this Pope's particular concern, that is, the poorer you are and the more marginalized you are, the less likely you are, at least according to this poll, among Italians, to actually like it. And it's just, you know, 
explain these results however you want. They are nevertheless interesting. All right, third up this week, Ukraine fires back. So on Good Friday, a year ago, right, one year ago, Good Friday 2022, Pope Francis got into some hot water in terms of Ukrainians because he asked a Ukrainian woman and a Russian woman, two nurses, two friends, to carry the cross together during a station of the Via Crucis procession on Good Friday. Many Ukrainians saw that as moral relativism, saying that the aggressor when the war in Ukraine, i.e. Russia, and the victim, i.e. Ukraine, were on the same level. And there was a great deal of blowback. Even the leader of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, Archbishop Shevchuk, said at the time that he thought it was ill-advised, ambiguous, and just a bad idea. And, you know, the Ukrainian foreign ministry, the Ukrainian secretary of state, the foreign minister, and many other officials complained about it. All right. One year later, Good Friday, 2022, what does Pope Francis do? For the 10th Station of the Cross, it is devoted to the testimony, and now in this case it should be said, anonymous testimony, we don't know who these two people were, but of a Ukrainian youth and a Russian youth, both of whom were talking about their suffering as a result of the war. And once again, Ukrainians were angry. I mean, that night, the evening of Good Friday, the Ukrainian ambassador to the Holy See put out a tweet basically saying he was reacting to the testimony of this Russian youth who had talked about how he had lost his brother in the war and that his father and grandfather had been called up and sent to the front and he had no idea what had happened to them. What the Ukrainian ambassador to the Holy See said, well, you know what? What this Russian isn't saying is that his family members were sent into Ukraine not simply to kill the brother of this Ukrainian kid, but to kill his entire family, to wipe them all out. And that that probably should have been mentioned if you want to give an accurate picture of the situation. So flash forward this past week, in other words, after Holy Week was over, we heard from a spokesperson from the Ukrainian foreign ministry who again accused the Pope and the Vatican of conflating the aggressor in the conflict and the victim, basically saying we want the Vatican to walk this back, we want the Vatican to apologize because this is unacceptable. We also heard from the Latin Rite Bishop of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, who said that for Ukrainians, putting Russians and Ukrainians into the same boat is unacceptable. Said this just will not work. He said, if you want to talk about the equal suffering of Russians and Ukrainians, that's a conversation for when the war is over. Said for right now, you know, what has to be talked about is who is on the right side and who is on the wrong side. And the Russians, he was suggesting, are clearly on the wrong side. You know, here's the thing. As the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The Vatican could claim credibly, or the Pope could claim credibly in 2022, that is last year, to be surprised by Ukrainian reaction. This year, they cannot claim that any of this is a surprise. They had to know full well going in that there was going to be backlash from Ukraine. They decided to do it anyway. And obviously what that suggests, it is that it is important enough to Pope Francis to be seen to be as close to neutral as possible in this conflict, that is to be open to both sides, to not be allied with NATO or the West or the United States, not to be against Russia and its allies in this conflict. That impression of being super partes above the parties is important enough to Pope Francis that he is willing to risk diplomatic and political blowback, and not just from Ukraine, but from everybody who is supporting Ukraine in this conflict. And this is, of course, part of a much bigger picture. Pope Francis attempting to realign the Vatican, not as another Western power, but as a genuinely global, multilateral player on the geopolitical chessboard, a voice of conscience that is genuinely non-aligned. And whether you admire that project or not, what this episode confirms for us is that it is clearly a top priority for Pope Francis, one for which he is willing to pay an occasionally steep 
price. All right, finally this week, we end with the story of the Madonna di Trevignano Romano. Now, you might think the other three stories we've talked about, this controversy over John Paul II, right? Or this new Italian pulp, or the controversy between Ukraine and the Vatican. You might think those would be the biggest Vatican stories in Italy this week, right? No, you would be wrong. The single most talked about story, Catholic story, in this country over the past week is this Madonna, little Madonna, in a town called Trevignino Romano, which is about 30 to 40 miles north of Rome, nestled on a lake. And since 2016, there is a statue of the Madonna there that has been bleeding, crying blood from the eyes, and it has become a major attraction for pilgrims and believers from all over, particularly from all over Italy. Now, as I say, this has been going on since 2016. There was an effort to debunk it a few years ago, but it sort of continued. What has happened recently is that there are a couple of ex-devotees of this statue who kind of, and of the seer, the woman to whom this statue belongs, and who claims that it has been giving her revelations ever since, a woman by the name of Gisela Carina, Cara, Caina, who is a native Sicilian, moved to this town, Treviano Romano, went to Metagorgia, bought this statue, brought it back, and ever since, has been claiming that it has been providing her revelations. All right. As I say, there have been doubts about her all along, but what has happened recently is that a couple ex-members of her following, who had actually given substantial amounts of money to sort of spruce up this location where these revelations happen on the third of every month, by the way, they kind of soured on her and they hired a private investigator who looked into this and who claims that the blood on this statue of the Madonna is actually pig's blood, the suggestion being, of course, that this is a fraud, and has provided all this information to the Carabinieri, the Italian military police. So the Carabinieri have said they are going to open an investigation. Meanwhile, the diocese in which all this is going on has also opened its own investigation. And according to the Italian newspaper Il Messaggero, this includes drawing on priests from Rome who recently came down on the 3rd of April to take part in this praying of the rosary and this act of devotion. These priests, five or six of them, who were dressed in lay clothing, that is, they weren't wearing their Roman collars, but dressed as ordinary lay people, who apparently spread out through the crowd and were trying to collect information about it. And and are funneling this information to this diocesan investigation, the results of which are supposed to be made public in a few days and are expected to be negative. That is, expecting to conclude that there is nothing supernatural about all this. As I say, this has become a kind of cause celeb in Italian public opinion because what it does is it highlights two eternal truths about Italy. One is this country I don't care how secular it may appear on the surface. You scratch beneath that surface, and there is a hunger to believe in this country, an ineradicable Catholicity about it, that you give it an outlet and it will explode, like Vesuvius. Okay, that's point one. Point two is that there is also a kind of cynicism about the exploitation for financial gain and for celebrity of that deep hunger to believe that is the product of centuries of hard experience. And this story brings them both together. You know, I don't know what conclusion the diocese is going to reach. I don't know what conclusion the Italian military police are going to reach. But I will say that perhaps the smartest single thing I heard about this story I was watching a piece on Rai, that's the Italian National TV Network, and they were interviewing a bunch of people from Trevignano Romano, the town where all this is going on. And there was one elderly woman 
who asked her opinion said, I don't believe it. I haven't believed it from the beginning because you know what? You find the Madonna in church. That's it. You find the Madonna in church. You don't find her on a hillside bleeding from the eyes. But, you know, if you want to meet the Madonna, you don't need something funky or weird or out of the ordinary. You can simply go to church, meet her there, have her enter your heart, put your cares before her, and all will be well. Yeah. To me, that smacks of wisdom. All right, that is our show for this week. As ever, you can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Again, cruxnow.com. As I said at the top, thank you so much for your support and interest in this program. Keep watching. We'd love to get to 20 million, 20,000, sorry. We'd love to get to 20,000 subscribers and 2 million viewers. So let's just keep it going. We will be here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.